Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton and this is Family Life in the North Country. Well, to start with, I have an interesting inquiry here. I had one that says, I've been hearing about some different kinds of therapies in magazines. Apparently the person had written, or rather had read in a magazine about some mental and emotional problems that uh, and treatment had to do with blinking of the eyes. And the question was, did I know anything or could I explain that? Well, I'd like to explain it. However, I know about it, but really I don't know how it works. Uh, or rather, I don't know why it works. I know that it uh, does seem to work, but it's not just blinking of the eye. There's a whole pattern to it, and uh, it's it's involving a process of how people think. And actually, it's uh, pretty fast in helping people get over some of the effects of trauma. It is shocks that have happened in people's lives. Now, it is a a process that involves having to do with uh, the eye movements. And the one who originated it, this particular therapy, uh, was really trying to figure out why people, when they're dreaming, uh, have rapid eye movements or when they're sleeping. And this is really a, an elaboration of that. and. Uh, Interestingly enough, it seems to work. Well, here's another one. He came in said, uh, are people getting married younger today? Well, actually, no. See, more and more people aren't getting married. And what happens is that uh, it has become very common that people live together uh, in a way, you know, fact and in a way they have their honeymoon first and then maybe even some years later they decide to get married but it may not be to the one they went on a honeymoon with. So no, people aren't getting married younger. Actually they're getting married later, those who are getting married. And some people, as you know, aren't getting married at all. Well we switch from that one to the question Sometimes people ask very specific, rather direct questions. And this one was, what do children need most? And the party said, uh, no double talk, just a straight answer. One word answer, mother. As far as what children need most, I think a person has a mother, a child has a mother then that assumes that uh, there's going to be mother's love and everything that's associated with it. Uh, if a child has mother's love, and it's a pretty good bet that child's going to be all right. And there are a lot of people who uh, try to buy substitutes and arrange substitute mothers, that sort of thing, but it's, uh, it's a problem. I haven't found anything yet that uh, substitutes for a good mother. Well, here's another one. What is this idea of rationing about health care that I've heard about? I've read it in the news, I've read it and heard it. I'm sure others have, but the idea of rationing health care. Well, it, uh, it's presented as if it's something new, but actually it isn't. See, any time we have limited resources, what we've had to have is somebody to make decisions as to who gets those resources. And in effect, that's rationing. But what's come up is a little bit different, a little different slant on the old idea, is uh, categorizing people by age, for example, that a person over 65 wouldn't necessarily be given definitive treatment, wouldn't be given care. Uh, when I mentioned 65, it made me think that in 1960s, early 60s, I was part of a study where we were trying to figure out at the time what was happening to old people who were committed to mental hospitals. 
prior to that time, anybody who was 65 and was committed to a mental hospital for, uh, oh, behavior disturbances at the time. In some states it was called insanity, others mental illness. But a survey was done, and what we found that basically in the United States, most people who became patients in mental hospitals, if they were over 65, they didn't get any treatment. They were given a diagnosis basically of cerebral arterial sclerosis, or senile brain disease, and uh, warehoused until they died. And that was a fact. Well, in effect, you see, that was rationing because it was an automatic decision that somebody who was over 65 wasn't going to get any better. And it was a very limited uh, staff and limited resources. Most states had very small budgets for mental hospitals, including New York State. Uh, who are you going to treat? So the decision was made to treat young people, people who would have a chance, uh, who might get better. Well, that went out of vogue. I'm happy to say that the place where I worked, we, uh, under a rather innovative person, we turned that around. We found that when we really made a definitive examination of people who were over 65, it turned out most of them were depressed. People had landed, landed in mental hospitals and they may have had physical conditions that could be treated. And so in the place where I worked, which became the largest uh, psychiatric residency training program in the world, people started getting better, including those who were over 65. It was quite amazing. But what we're having, though, today is a decision, to, in effect, to go back and say, well, people who are over certain ages aren't going to be allowed to do certain things. Also, there's another twist to this that people who have private care, for example, I retired from the university system. When I retired from state university system, all of my unused sick leave went to buy, to purchase on a per diem basis, health care. Okay. I had no sick days at all during my time with state university of New York. I was fortunate, never used a sick day. So basically, I had health insurance for a long time in the future that I'd already paid for with unused sick days. But what happened? <clears throat> well, I presume the insurance industry was behind it, but along came change in regulations that said anybody who's 65, that automatically Medicare would be the primary insurer. Well, Medicare pays for my health care nowadays primarily, and anything it doesn't pay, then my uh, private insurance pays. Do you know what they're talking about? Making it now so that nobody can have private insurance to pay for whatever the Medicare doesn't pay for. That sounds a little strange, doesn't it? Well, that's what's going on. But that's what's really behind the question about what's this thing about rationing with health care. Not only rationing, but even preventing people who have the resources from purchasing additional health care beyond what Medicare pay for. A little puzzling, isn't it? Most people aren't aware of it. We also have involved in all of these things called uh, health management organizations, HMOs. See, for many years, generations and generations, we had physicians taking care of patients. Patients paid the physician. That seemed to be working fine. Now we have an organization over here that says to the physicians, well, if you give certain kinds of care, we'll give you a percentage. It says to the patients, you have to go through us. So what we've had is a middleman put in the middle but as an intermediary and the HMOs are telling physicians what they can do and still receive full benefits and also telling patients, people who are sick and need care, what kind of care they need. And somebody has to pay them. Well, guess who pays the HMOs? Same one who paid the physician. 
In other words, the HMOs are taking money out of the medical care system as for profit, of course, and uh, sometimes it gets kind of messy. People don't have a simple kind of thing of going to the physician. The physician says, I think this is what your problem is, and this is what the medication is I would prescribe or the treatment. Sometimes now the uh, physician is limited, has to go through certain procedures, make sure it's the right procedure, the correct procedure. And sometimes people aren't even permitted to stay in hospitals, uh, perhaps like they need to. It's a new system and it has a lot of wrinkles in it. But let's go on to another question. Question then, we we'll switch over to education. The question is, is there a good position for a family to take today about education of the children? I think it's an excellent question. I think very timely because what we're seeing in all sorts of research on education, we're seeing a need for young people to develop character. That's the one thing that we need most in the educational system, character. Uh, that starts in the home. The schools are supposed to supplement that, add to it. Then we need substance, substance in what's being taught. Not just procedural situational ethics, but substance. We need uh, to help children learn high levels of cognitive school skill. In other words, how to think, how to use the head. We see people being taught all sorts of special things sometimes, technical things, but we don't see people <coughs> being turned out as a group who seem to be able to function independently. The ability to think about a problem and to apply the resources to solving that problem, that's very important. We also need, of course, to have self-esteem being taught. And today, so many schools are focusing on self-esteem. But self-esteem should be also based and should include feeling good about yourself because you know how to do something. You know how to solve problems. But then we need people to be taught how to be willing to serve, to serve others. Sometimes we get involved in these things in what's called outcome-based education. Well, that has an upside and a downside. Outcome-based education basically means you stay in the system or the situation until you learn what you're supposed to know. And uh, it has an unfortunate kind of thing. And for example, you couldn't run a ball team that way. You couldn't say, well, we'll play the game on the basis of the ability of the poorest player. Uh, no, that's what outcome-based education is often uh, a reflection of. It gears down so that everybody passes. <clears throat> it's a quest for mediocrity. You hear that word, mediocrity. Basically, it means average, and it's a quest to say that everybody will be the average. Well, what happens to the people who are better than average? What happens to the leaders? What happens to the people who need to get out there and show and do more than simply the average. The quest for mediocrity, I think, is a very sad thing to have as far as a political climate. And we're seeing a national political effort in that direction. Sure, we need minimum standards. We need to know that people <clears throat> have the ability to do certain things, that the person is competent, minimum standards, competency-based, sure, but have those standards that are realistic. You know, that sort of thing, education really starts at home. And it should be supplemented and added to by the schools and uh, the character building that I mentioned to start with on that really is before age six. That may seem strange, but that's before most of the schooling takes in these children and tries to add to them, but it should be then the rest of the school age should be adding to what basically the families have, so it starts with the families. Here's another quick question, says, can people change? <laughs> can people change? Of course people change. We are changing. It's 
somebody says, can we change? You're a different person than you were a moment ago. Our body is constantly changing. Can we change our basic traits? Can we change our basic characteristics? It's possible. But you really have to make a commitment in order to do that, a very serious commitment. Without a commitment, don't expect any change. With a serious commitment, intention, practice, I don't know anybody who can't change. <clears throat> There's no reason to think that uh, people shouldn't be able to change. Why not? We are changing. Now, what way are we changing? Until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This family life in the North Country, have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Hometown Cable here. Start off with a question. How are families alike? You know, we hear so much about families today, families being different. The question I think is appropriate. How are they alike? Most families are like every other family. Here's the reason. The basic reason is because they're made up of individuals and individuals have the same basic needs. So if the people in families are basically alike, then the families themselves are going to be alike. But think about it a little bit. We have two people coming from different backgrounds, and uh, we have, uh, they meet and they get married and they have families. What, what do they have in common? Well, we have people who in families who have to have responsibility. We have people with authority. We have caretakers and we have care receivers, caregivers and care receivers, children. The basic needs of humanity remain the same. We have to have the uh, ability to solve problems. Problems are going to come up in every relationship. How is intimacy to be shared? What are the restrictions on intimacy in family life? That's common in families. The conflict resolutions, how do people get over problems? That's going to be a big factor. So with the basic premise that families are made up of people with common needs, for example, everybody in a family has a need to be recognized, has a need for new experiences, has a need to feel good about self, self-esteem, has a need to know that I'm really good at something. I can do this well. It really doesn't mean that I actually can, but if I feel that I can, if I think I can, that's what's important. Everybody in the family has the need for a way of explaining life and the world to himself. These things are important. So, when everybody has the same needs, families are alike. <clears throat> well, here's a question. Every now and then somebody comes along. I even get questions like this. People call up and say uh, something like this. I understand you specialize in family life. What is the study of family life? Well, <clears throat> for starters, we could study family life by studying the history of families. Just think about it. Let's, for starters, let's say that Adam and Eve had a family. So we could start with that one and watch families and study families in all different cultures, how families operate. You can study families from the developmental approach. For example, the typical family has you know, eight stages in the family life cycle. Eight stages. The beginning stage when people first marry, and uh, the childbearing stage, preschool, school age, teenage, the launching years, families go through the same patterns when the kids are leaving home. Then the middle years when all of a sudden the parents find themselves uh, at home alone and there were even some commercials being made on that today, aren't there? When the last child leaves home. The empty nest syndrome. And then there's a stage of retirement and old age. And so basically you can study families that they, the family does essentially the same thing as any other family in the same stages. You can study family life from the economic perspective. The family is a basic unit of consumerism. It's a basic 
consumer unit in society. So, what's purchased, what's used, what's wasted. You can study families from a religious angle, from a religious perspective. What does uh, this particular religion say about family life and this religion and that religion? What are the powers, the duties, the functions, the obligations of the father, of the mother, of children? <coughs> you can study family life from a sociological perspective. You know, the family is an institution, and by that it means it is a group of people with certain expectations. Well, those expectations differ from one society to another. In some ways, in most ways they're alike. Another way to study family life is what's called the structure and function. Example, <clears throat> who's head of the family? We have two heads, we have equal heads, we have a mother, a father, and the children. Is the family organized according to what it's going to do? For example, the typical farm family, the agricultural family, is really a basic economic unit as well. A family uh, owning a dairy farm, for example, highly organized has to be in order to function. Particularly if it's uh, starting out, or it's relatively new or relatively small. Typically, the, each member of the family has a job to do, and functions that way. So, uh, are families structured according to what they do, or are they structured according to something else? Another way of studying family life is to study the interactions of the individuals, the one-on-one. -on -one. How do people communicate? What method, what form of communication? You can study families, and there was a very interesting study of families in crisis. How do families function? How do they operate when there's a crisis? Uh, I think it's very interesting to see families in a situation what happened? Well, it was found. You might be interested to know some of the results. A sociologist, uh, Henry Moore, down in Texas with a lot of tornadoes, went around and studied families which had experienced tornadoes very recently, been involved in those twisters. And he found that the families that functioned best were the ones that had an organization. They, they weren't just everybody's equal. Somebody took charge, somebody organized a family, held it together, put it back in functioning, and they went on with the next crisis until the next one. You can study family life, of course, from a legal perspective. There are different ways. All of these things are part of family life. Each dimension, each element in different cultures, different times in history. So, yes, Studying family life can be a little complicated. Interestingly, it's the most researched area of all of the uh, social studies, social sciences. More research has been done on family life than any others. <clears throat> well, uh, fortunately, most people don't have to know these things, just grow up and have a happy family. You know, some of the best families. They can't even spell family, whatever language they speak, but they may have an excellent family. Being educated doesn't necessarily mean people are going to have a good family life. It helps, but it's not uh, the most essential thing. Here's a question. <clears throat> Another question says, and, and this is a frequent question, how important is religion for children? And the inquiry goes on to state, most children object to going to church and don't seem to pay a lot of attention anyway. Isn't it better to wait and let them make their own decisions when they're older? I've had that question come up frequently. Uh, with very serious, well-intentioned people who really want to make the best decision for the children. The two answers, no and very. No. It's. Uh, not best to wait. And religion is very important. Two answers there, and here's the reason. You can't keep children from learning. Whatever the parents do and don't do, the children are going to learn from that. 
it's impossible to keep children from learning. So if the parents do not set a model of going to whatever religion, functions, church, synagogue, whatever, temple that they have, if the children don't see the parents doing that, the children automatically make the assumption that it isn't important, it's not part of the life that they're supposed to lead. So if uh, at some magic age the parents let them know later, well, it's up to you to make a decision. See, what have the parents already decided? They've already decided to teach the children religion isn't important, basically. Isn't important enough for it to be part of their own life. And here's what you can, I, I think really relevant to a question like that. Every society has religion. Children need to learn about religion early to be a part of the ongoing relationships in the society. See, every culture has religion. There's been no society ever found, according to Malinowski, an anthropologist, none have been found without some form of religion. Children need to learn what that is. <coughs> They then later will make their own decisions, of course, whether or not to follow it, improve on it, change it. <clears throat> but children need to have a core of beliefs. They need to have substance. It's part of the character building. Very important for children. And they learn it best when they're young. If they just incorporate it when they're young, I think that's the easiest way. There are teachable moments. And there are critical periods when people can learn things better at one age than another. I think we all know that. If we're exposed to uh, a different language when we're young, we can learn it very quickly, very easily. If we wait until we're adults and try to learn it, <laughs> like I tried to learn German after I was, um, golly, how old was I? 40 years old. I tried to learn German. It's kind of rough. Um, but the only thing I really learned trying to study German, I think, is why the Germans lost World War II, and that's uh, they couldn't find a verb in the sentences until it, they'd already been hit. Uh, but we all know that there are critical periods in time when children learn better at an age than some other. Here's another question that's not really unrelated. It says, do children have any obligations in the family? <clears throat> See, I see more and more children today <coughs> excuse me, who are being taught <coughs> not by design, <coughs> excuse me, but basically by uh, just passively, that they don't have any functions. They're not expected to do anything. They go home, turn on the television, sit there, eat supper. Maybe they wash up, maybe they do a little homework and go to bed. They don't have any functions. They don't have anything expected of them. Some parents are so busy trying to be perfect parents, they forget that children have things to do. Yes, in every society, regardless of the social class, in other words, regardless of how well off a family might be, children have some basic functions. They should have obligations. They have the obligation to be loyal and supportive of the family functions and duties, its beliefs regardless of the society. Some families can't even identify, the parents can't identify what it believes in, what they believe in. Children have an obligation to take the training and the teaching that the parents offer, to try to learn it, to be better as adults than the parents are. That's every society. Sure, if somebody differs, somebody really questions that, just think about animals. In the animal kingdom, where animals are born independent, if those little animals don't follow the parents, they die. That's rather simple. Well, a human animal is born quite dependent, and if they don't follow the parents, they don't fit right in with the parents' schedule. In today's society, because of all the support services, they may not die, but they're not going to be well off. It's the same thing. Most of the behavior of parents with 
children, is to teach the children how to survive, and most of the behavior of children should be to learn those lessons well, and to fit right in, and they will. We see this sort of thing all the time in the animal kingdom. Mother Nature takes care of this sort of thing. Well, Mother Nature applies to human beings too. Parents are the teachers, they are the best teachers, they can't keep from teaching. It doesn't mean that every parent is good, of course not. But on the whole, that's what we have. And we see it functioning best. We see people who are comfortable. When children know what their obligations are, they know what their duties are, they don't have to wonder who I am. We see so many people saying, well, I have to go find myself. That's a strange kind of thing, isn't it? Why would it, somebody have to go find himself? Where's he been? He is somebody, regardless where he is, and so how do you go find yourself someplace? Uh, sure, I have worked with that sort of thing many, many years. Forty-eight years and more as a professional, before that as a student. People go and find themselves. Hmm. You know, it's interesting to see a youngster who already knows who he is, feels good about himself because his parents weren't stingy with what they were teaching. Help the child learn what the child's supposed to do. Help the child become better at it. Doesn't mean the parent has to have the child following in his footsteps. Heavens no. Because a child can learn and become secure in one thing and then look around and see what else he may want to do. And a good teacher is proud when the student surpasses the teacher. In other words, one of my students became better at something that I was teaching than I was. That I considered was a credit to my teaching. That was a good thing to have. I wasn't competitive with them. I didn't try to hold them down. Great. Go where I've never been. That's really what learning is all about. Well, until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. And today we're going to be talking about counseling. Here's an interesting question. I found it interesting, maybe you will too. The question was, in counseling, do you ever think it's okay to touch the people you're counseling? Touch. The answer is yes, but under very carefully controlled circumstances. See, when people come for counseling, they're usually troubled. They're usually uh, not sure about some things or reaching out for help. The person usually feels he needs help or he wouldn't come for counseling. He needs help in helping find his resources, uh, develop his resources in order to uh, solve his own problems. And in that sense, he may be, or she may be vulnerable. In other words, uh, the person who's having trouble in marriage you know, and having taught many, many people uh, how to do counseling, uh, what we have to teach them also is sometimes how to be so careful with people whose feelings are raw, they may have been hurt, a person may be uh, looking for comfort and warmth and solace and understanding. And that's what counselors are supposed to have. They're supposed to have at least understanding. They may not know the answers to problems. Most of the time we don't have to know answers, but we have to know enough to help people find their own answers. That's what we're really about. And sometimes a hand is a great thing. I know some who are Typically, huggers. You know, they meet somebody and they hug the person. Uh, I know others who won't hug at all. And it's so much on the person. So the answer to the question is yes. Touching sometimes is very therapeutic. Most of us recently have 
uh, observed at least uh, in, in news releases about Mother Teresa. She hugged just about anybody she came across, didn't she? Just about everybody. And she hugged people that some of us uh, would have to have a blindfold or something on. Mother Teresa would do it, and she did it, as you probably know, and she said it so often. She did it because she was bringing Jesus Christ to the people. Uh, other people can't do that. Other people don't seem to be able to do it. But to answer the question, yes. There is a place sometimes very important, and sometimes it some it becomes the most important part of helping somebody is a hand up, a pat on the back, our holding hands. You know, I know in riding an ambulance sometimes with people who are hurting and distressed, very sad about no telling what all's happened, the tragedy, you get into car wrecks, things like that. I know that sometimes uh, <clears throat> just holding the person's hand <coughs> excuse me, may be very comforting and very helpful. Just holding the hand, going down the highway. Sure, maybe doing IVs or all kinds of other things. But somebody who uh, is in that circumstance, you can imagine if you were in it yourself, and somebody holds your hand while you're there, it works. Here's another question. It's a simple question, but a very, uh, very complex one. I've had it many times. The question is, what is love? You know, I have hundreds of books describing about love and how to give love in different ways. And we're seeing it, and it's always been that way, that there's some people going around preaching and teaching and basically selling it. But what is it? What is it? So often the therapeutic endeavors all kinds of fancy words. Basically what they seem to me to be saying is love your clients. Show them real love. And that's very important. Well in English language we, we're kind of limited. We only have one word for love, but in some languages it's much easier. For example, some of you are familiar with the words filial, agape, and eros. Those are three different kinds of love. We try to, in the English language, we try to lump it all together. Brotherly love, a love of society, and physical love. Those are the what those words mean. What may be love for one person may not be for another. We have some pretty good references. And, uh, for example, sonnets from the Portuguese. Elizabeth Baird Browning. Here's a very famous sonnet, and it's to Robert Browning. Uh, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely, as men strive for right. I love thee purely, as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my children's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. When I was in uh, high school we studied things like that. Very beautiful expression, you read it in many places. It's easier sometimes to say what love isn't than what it really is. I've used with many people because I've been a teacher for many years. I guess anybody's a teacher. If you have children you're a teacher, you can't keep from it. But I often teach uh, people, even in counseling, when they talk about love, I sometimes use this standard, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 
which is love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous. It is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interest. It is not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's part of an expression that many people are familiar with, but they forget it sometimes when they're dealing with each other. They need a standard to go by. Now, the standard I just read is rather idealistic. But if we don't have standards, we can't do much. You know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Sonnets from the Portuguese to 1 Corinthians 13 that most people have a copy of in their home. Most people have a copy of the Bible. That's where that is. In the New Testament. They have ready reference there. But most of the time people talk about love in a special way. God's love. Well, characteristic of God's love are also rather interesting and clear. It's given freely. You know, this is what I find in marriage counseling. So often it isn't given freely. People say, I love you when, or I love you if. Love in God's characteristic is given permanently. I find that also a problem in marriage counseling. To love is to love freely and permanently. Also a characteristic of God's love is totally. And most people have trouble with that. Totally? No, I'll, I'll love you this much, but not all the way. I'll do this, but not all the way. I'll do this. God's love is total, so we're told. It's also life-giving, and it's based on specific knowledge. Those are characteristics of love that people can shoot for, can try to get into. And I think if they were to try, they would uh, they'd probably have a better relationship. Let's go to another question. It says, why is it that children reared in the same family turn out so differently? Well, you know, I've had this question come up ever since I started studying family life. And that was way back in my undergraduate days. Actually, no child is ever raised in the same family. You say, how'd that come about? Okay, take the parents. Two parents, opposite sex, coming from different families themselves. One's a son, one's a daughter. <clears throat> they meet, they have a child. Just analyze it. Okay, the child. Is it boy or girl? It complements one of the other parents. <clears throat> it's like one parent but not the other one. It's the first child. It's also a grandchild. It's a niece, it's a nephew. There are expectations for that child. Not only the parents' expectations, but grandparents' expectations, uncles, aunts. We have a whole cluster of things that happen with that child. Well, let's look at that family and say, okay, they have another child. They have a daughter. Uh-oh. What do you know? The firstborn child, let's say it was a son, is no longer the, an only child. It's the older child. The daughter is the baby now. And the baby is the first girl. And that little girl has expectations given to her. She's not in the same family that her brother was born into. There are different expectations. Quite a few different expectations. Let's look at it another way. Let's say that, what do you know, there's a third child. Let's say another son comes along. Okay, the daughter now is no longer the baby in the family. She's the girl. Each child has a brother. Not each child has a sister. The little girl doesn't have a sister. But each boy has a brother. We have two boys and a girl. That's a different relationship. We have a middle child now. 
a little girl is a middle child. The youngest is a son, and he's the baby. <clears throat> so we get into all kinds of different patterns here. And it depends on how much age difference there is. We have roles to play. The oldest is supposed to do thus and so. The eldest child is just expected to do certain things. The parents themselves learn how to take care of children with the first child. They don't worry quite so much with the other children as they come along because they learn how. They've been broken in, so to speak. Went on a Hamlin's call recently where it seemed to me from an outsider's standpoint <coughs> The biggest problem was the parents were trying so hard to be good parents. They were a little bit afraid of the child grasping for breath and uh, appropriately they called the ambulance. But the next child they probably won't do that for that same kind of condition. Well, we all with our first children kind of learn how to be parents. We learn how to be parents from children. You don't learn it from a book. You can learn some things from books, but it's not the same as having a child, particularly at three o'clock in the morning, a child that's sick, that sort of thing. Not very many books are uh, very comforting for that. We have so many different patterns that go on with this particular family. If you try to say, well, those children were all reared in the same family. No, they're not. That oldest son the older of two sons, the oldest child there, he's in a different family than the youngest. And that's the way it is with all of us. So instead of wondering why people turn out to be different, I think we ought to turn it around and wonder, isn't it amazing that they turn out to be so much alike? Sure, families have characteristics. Take your own marriage, for example. Those of you who are married, my marriage, your marriage, our marriage. We all have three marriages, don't we? Those of us who are married. We have a marriage as we see it, as we feel it, as we sense it. There's the marriage as the husband or wife sees it, different from ours. And then there's the marriage that we see have together, that we see together, that we relate to together. So yours, mine, and ours. Same way about the children, isn't it? Just like that family. Is it my son, your son, or our son? Is it my daughter, your daughter, or our daughter? We hear that all the time, don't we? It's an interesting kind of world. <clears throat> the family is a system. And it's a system that functions regardless. You know, you don't have to have all the elements present in the system for it to work. But the family is like one of these mobiles hanging up. We've all seen those things that are hanging up, balanced on the ceilings, wind blows. You touch any part of that, and the whole element is influenced. Family's that way. Everybody doesn't have to be there for the family to be intact. In other words, children go to school, dad goes to work, mother goes somewhere else. Maybe she goes to work too nowadays, but still has a family. And that's the way it is. Family is a system. It's the best known system to raise children in. Well, until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. Family life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton, and this is Family Life in the North Country. Well, to start off with today, let's talk about families. Here's one question. Well, actually, it was a statement, too. It said, some families are so different. They're cold and distant, while others seem to be warm and affectionate. And the party who asks that says, what gives? What gives? Well, the parents set the stage for that. <clears throat> when you look at it, you know, sometimes people find somebody and marry somebody just like themselves. Uh, we oftentimes think that opposites attract. Well, sometimes they do, but also opposites repel. Uh, most people marry people like themselves. So, 
if a person is typically uh, shy, uh, kind of cold, kind of distant, chances are that person going to find somebody just like it. And uh, what happens then to the family, the children? Well, they grow up, learn to act the same way. So the idea of complementarity, <coughs> excuse me, that was an idea that was kicked around quite a bit one time in research on family life that people would find other people to offset their weaknesses or to substitute and make up for their needs. It was a fine idea, but uh, research in depth showed that it uh, that's not what most people do. It works for some people, but others not. And it's sad that uh, some people just seem to be in the business of running families. They never had the idea that being in a family life was warm and cordial or fun. Some people don't uh, don't even know that, that brothers and sisters uh, can have a lot of fun together. And yet at the same time, uh, oh, a generation or so ago, most people visit in the home I guess two generations ago, most people's visitors were relatives. In other words, the people typically had most of their good times and their fun times with relatives. Sometimes uh, people who simply uh, they get married and uh, they have children, they're in the business of running a family. That's what it seems like when you step back and you study the family. What happens? Well, the whistle blows, they get up. They go through a ritual, they may have breakfast, they do their morning things, they punch the clock, go out the door and do their things. The evening comes, people come back in, whistle blows, punch the clock, do their things, over and over and over again. Just in the business of running families. Not really with a feeling of family life, not, uh, not enjoying family life, not uh, getting into depth of feeling. That's kind of sad sometimes. Some families uh, appear to me sometimes like cold wars. Well, here's another one. Talking about families, somebody recently, and it came up several times in the conversation, asked me about dysfunctional families. I've been hearing dysfunctional families now for about 20 years, and the word dysfunctional, it is, it's a popular word. But uh, I don't know what it means. I know what the word dysfunctional means. It means sick or sad uh, or ill. Dys, D-Y-S, means ill. But uh, somebody says, well, I came from a dysfunctional family. I don't know what that means. I want the person to tell me. And I'd rather, much rather learn about how the wellness of the family uh, was expressed rather than how the sickness of the family. If I'm going to deal with a person or a family, I'm really going to deal with the wellness. I'm going to deal with the strength of the family, how much I can do about uh, sickness. But with the wellness, you can build on it, you can develop it, people can start looking at life a little differently. A change of attitude. Sometimes in dysfunctional families, the word means, uh, well, somebody was abusive, or uh, mother was flirtatious, or daddy was cold and indifferent, uh, or alcoholic. I don't know what the word means. It has to mean whatever the person wants it to mean, who uses it. It does not have a standard use as far as the literature in this field goes, of counseling, psychotherapy, social work. It just means that the family was not healthy. I've had people come up to me, for example, and say, well, uh, I'm a schizophrenic. I might say, okay, what do you want me to do? Uh, how do you want me to relate to you? I'm not going to relate to the person as a schizophrenic. I relate to the person as a person. So the person has some kind of behavior and somebody got a label one time. Uh, but oftentimes people don't feel that way. And that's the way dysfunctional family comes in. 
They want to carry it around, pull a little red wagon behind them and say, see, this explains all my problems and you're supposed to just accept me for my problems. I don't, I don't deal that way. Here's another one. It says, of, uh, how do people's problems predict the future? No, that's not unrelated to the other one. <clears throat> you know, we've spent a lot of time in research, research on family life, sociology particularly. One time I uh, could claim to be a sociologist, belonged to the American Sociological Association for several years. Do you know there's very little prediction? If you take a set of conditions, in family life and then try to predict the future, there's very little reliability. What happens most of the time and throughout history is that we see some problems that people have and we look back to try to explain what caused the problems. See, retrospective analysis. Take a group of people, certain things happen, and then try to predict what those people are going to turn out to be. That's very difficult. And it really isn't done reliably. So the people's problems anyone may have at a particular time doesn't lock anyone in. In other words, something that happens to me, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm committed or locked in or I have to act a certain way or avoid acting a certain way in the future. Not at all. What perhaps is more important is not what happened, but what I think about it. What I think about myself in reference to what happened. That makes me think of one of the, uh, oh, perhaps most of you have heard about it, <coughs> predictions about German measles. For pregnant mothers had German measles in the first trimester. I know when I was a, oh, a young young person and a young professional, even a young father, I remember the German measles scare. People said it uh, it meant that the babies were going to be deformed, that they were going to have abnormalities. Well, let's look at that as an example of research. <clears throat> what was found was that uh, a lot of people in institutions for the mentally retarded, it was found that their mothers had, had German measles. That's where that got started. So people would think German measles is terrible. Well, of course, it's certainly worse for mothers in early pregnancy, but when we went back and we studied people who'd had German measles and then found out what happened to their children. And the vast majority were not affected. Most of the children didn't turn out to have any kind of handicap. And uh, that's the problem you see with trying to predict the future on the basis of here's a group of people with a problem and look back and see what caused it. Sort of like the hindsight. All of us are familiar with that. Hindsight's great. Foresight's a little different. We're all pretty good in hindsight. Monday, Monday uh, quarterbacking. Well, here's a here's something interesting that came up recently. <clears throat> Someone commented, and, and I got a question, and I started doing some research on it. Person said, "I've heard that men have about four billion. That's a billion with a B." more brain cells than women. Well, you know, that sort of statement's kind of shocking. <clears throat> you can think about, well, where do they have them? That why men have big heads? They have to have all that space for those extra four billion brain cells? But <clears throat> I read that also in an article, and I did a little checking. And it seems to be basically true. The difference is uh, the average woman may have 19 billion brain cells, and the average man has about 23 billion. I don't 
know the answer and why that is so. <coughs> I uh, checked with uh, people who are in neuroscience and studying this sort of thing. I made a phone call and uh, asked one of my sons who uh, is about to get a doctorate degree in that field. I said, what do you know about this? You people who are studying the very latest things. Uh, and if that's true, if men have this four billion extra brain cells, where are they? What part of the brain are they located in? Well, he gave me some good general answers, but he was uh, confirming it. Yes, that does seem to be true. Think about it. Wow. Now, Mother Nature is very conservative. Mother Nature doesn't waste anything. Uh, so there's bound to be a reason. We just don't know the reason why there's a difference yet. Certainly there's no evidence, by the way, that because men have more brain cells, they're more intelligent. No, that doesn't follow. Here's another question. <clears throat> what do you think is the biggest problem a person, a man or woman, can have? I think the biggest problem is a little four-letter word, hate. If a person has hate, is filled with hate, that person can't love. Hate is a very heavy burden for people to carry around. I've mentioned that several times on this program. But it's an awesome thing to be filled with hatred. The hated <coughs> controls the hater. In other words, if I'm full of hate, the person I'm supposed to be hating or the thing I'm supposed to be hating is controlling me. It interferes with what I might want to do. <clears throat> interferes in a way that keeps me from doing positive things. And just the opposite, if somebody were to ask me what's the greatest thing somebody could have or the nicest thing, I'd still come back with a little four-letter word. Say love. A person has love. That person is typically content is warm, is caring, <clears throat> very positive. A person who's filled with love is usually attractive to other people. Others want to be around that person. Conversely, a person who's filled with hate, eh, people typically don't want to be around them, except the peop other people who are also filled with hate. Sure. People who are full of hate like to get together. You could put it another way, people who are full of hate hate to get together, but they can't do anything else except get together with others like themselves because they don't seem to get along. Well, tell you what, let's hang in there for a minute. I'll uh, get back to you another time. This is Dr. John Middleton, Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Start off today with a question. <clears throat> it says, does the Catholic Church favor or oppose sex education in schools? Well, <clears throat> the question is logical, but perhaps the majority of the people right around here in the North Country are Catholic. Uh, so I did some studying on that. My best references show that the Catholic Church teaches that sex education is the responsibility of the parents and only if the parents are really not available then should sex education be allowed in schools. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't all kinds of shapes and sizes of sex education programs around and some even being promoted by perhaps a priest or sisters, religious that uh, wouldn't necessarily mean that that's what the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, the Catholic Church teaches that the parents are the responsible persons to teach sex education. And uh, when that happens, usually children are pretty well. 
set for life, they can get along pretty well. What we have happening, and this is regardless of what religion people may have, what we have happening is that when sex education is taught in the schools, and just about everybody gets all kinds of sex education taught today, whether it's in a uh, geography class, or a history class, or social studies, or English, I've run across all kinds of sex education courses. Here's what happens. When it's handled in a public school, basically it has to be taught without a moral basis. And there's the problem. That's the main problem. Because if you try to teach behavior without a moral basis, something as important in life as one's sexual conduct, in no society is sex unregulated. Never has been that way. Perhaps never will be that way. But it used to be that all the <clears throat> religious groups felt, believed, acted basically the same way about that. And uh, it works best. Most of the uh, problems in sexual morality have to have moral solutions. And you try to give solutions and you try to give an education without a moral basis to it, okay, you get into trouble. Here's another uh, question that came up. Said the word disengagement was used uh, the other day in a meeting about senior citizens. And the party wants to know what does that refer to? What does that mean? Well, disengagement refers to the idea that people move out of, and the older they get, the move out of social contacts, associations, and organizations. See, that's most uh, evident when people retire. When people retire, they typically move out of the uh, circle of friends, uh, the relationships, the associations they have related to work. But here's what's different about disengagement. We are all disengaging all along the life. But when people get to be whatever old is, they typically don't re-engage. See, most people when they were youngsters may have joined the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or Brownies or some such organization and did things as a group, maybe their Sunday school class or the CCD class or whatever, they were involved with different activities also related to school, engaged in things. And as they grew older, they disengaged from those groups and then re-engaged in something else. So it's an idea, the uh, author of that idea, is Dr. Henry, who used to be with the uh, New York Department of Mental Health. The idea is that disengagement is a characteristic of old people. Well, actually, I disagree. It is characteristic of older people only in the sense that older people don't re-engage. Here's another question. It says, my 15-year-old wants to start on the pill. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's absurd. Uh, naturally, any healthy 15-year-old is going to have some kind of sex drives, yearnings, desires, uh, even ambitions, but wisdom of the ages, it's not uh, something new, but the wisdom of the ages says, no, go slow and this sort of thing. And the pill is not a guarantee about anything. But a mother would answer, the person who asked the question, what should our answer be to the 15-year-old who wants to start on a pill? <clears throat> the answer should be, happiness that the child is healthy. Somebody who has a sex drive, wants to become sexually active, is probably physically healthy, but that doesn't mean that the person is mature. And to tell the daughter, well, I'm glad you're physically healthy and have all the right drives. Now, let's see if we can get the mind to be as mature as the body. See, too many people today are taught 
because it's uh, all around us in the media, but it's also even in some schools, public education, sex education, and even some parochial schools. They taught that young people can't control themselves, so you might as well give them the contraceptive devices or things and let them go. Uh, it's kind of sad because that makes an assumption that people are like animals. And just because the physical drive is there, they're going to express it. Now that's what education uh, is supposed to be about, is learning what to inhibit, when and how to inhibit one's own behavior. And the human beings are not instinctive that way. Not like dogs on the street, not like cows or horses in the field. No. When hormones hit, they have to act a certain way, and the animals don't have a choice. Well, people do. People have choices. And I think 15 is much too young to start engaging and in being involved in sexual behavior. Here's another question. <clears throat> says, Dr. Middleton, my wife has told me she doesn't love me anymore. What can I do? Well, even though the question is simple, the answer is in, in the question. To say, doesn't love me anymore, means a person once did love. So, answer the question, what can you do? Start thinking about how you acted, behaved, when she did love you. And when you start doing that, you may find that uh, your behavior has changed that you haven't been acting loving yourself. I've uh, known too many men who've gotten careless, too many women too. Take this husband or wife for granted and uh, don't care how they look, they don't care how they appear. Uh, I just thought of something, I remember telling the story one time on this program. A woman asked me one time if I'd ever kissed an ashtray full of stale cigar butts. <clears throat> she was trying to describe her husband. And he wanted to be affectionate when he hadn't shaved, he hadn't cleaned up, he hadn't brushed his teeth, he'd been smoking cigars, and he would come around like that. Well, that woman could say that she didn't love her husband when he acted that way. If you start acting believing like you did when your wife did love you, I think you'll find an interesting chapter in your book. Let me know how it comes out. Things like that uh, usually take a while to develop. Here's another question. It says, my husband is a dud. Do you have any recommendations to get people over being a dud? I enjoyed that question. <clears throat> I was thinking about anti-dud pills, or uh, undudding somebody. Uh, that sounds like a very real challenge. And I've had numerous wives complain about the husband behavior that could be called being a dud. What to do? Think about some history here. When did the person become a dud? Is there a reason? Sort of like the question about the uh, husband before. The wife didn't love him. Well, when did that come about? Well, if your husband has become a dud, when did that come about? Was he always that way? Now, if he was always that way, it may well have been that uh, you enjoyed him that way. That's why you married him. Or is it that he was always a dud and you changed? you become something else, and now he appears to be different. He may not have changed, but you have. Uh, I find that's pretty common. I often find, for example, in the middle-aged marriages <clears throat> that uh, husband and wife married, they had pretty much the same ideas of what they wanted in life, what they were going to do, how they were going to raise a family, who was going to be responsible for what? They had their jobs pretty well uh, thought about sometimes, even though they may not have talked about them very much. And things went along pretty well until, what do you know? The wife goes out and goes to work. The wife starts making money. When the 
starts making money, she wants to have some say about how it's spent. So the position of authority in the family sort of shifts. And the husband is no longer the sole breadwinner, and when he's no longer the sole breadwinner, uh, what happens? Well, he may start enjoying uh, more toys. The wife is making more money, and so they buy more toys to play with. Snowmobiles or skidoos or sea doos or whatever. But he may feel threatened as a person, as a man. And uh, sometimes they come around and say, What happened to our marriage? She's not like she used to be. True. She's changed. She's no longer the dependent person. She has uh, found out that she has uh, freedoms and she has authority and she enjoys some of it. The husband might say, but I haven't changed. That may well be true. Same thing about this husband who's been called a dud. You know, he may not really have changed. You might have changed. Look at it again. Here's another question having to do with husband and wife, and uh, sometimes it's interesting to see these families. <clears throat> a woman contacted me and said, my husband and I are avowed pacifist. We avoid all forms of violence. And our 13-year-old son is being pushed around and picked on by his peers because he won't fight back. How can we teach him? how to be a loving, peaceful person in society today. Well, it reminds me of another family. Same problem. Same problem, and uh, this kid was being pushed around. He was being picked on. He was falling apart, too, because he, the kids his age on school bus were picking on him. He wanted to follow what his parents were teaching, and yet he couldn't push the kids back. He and his uh, training had been told uh, never to resist, never to fight back, don't do anything. <clears throat> and he was suffering pretty much. Well, it was an interesting family to me because everybody in that family was very athletic, strong, active. I remember the father was, uh, he was a, a very strong athletic person. Uh, one of these uh, guys that went off ski slopes, jumps, he, he thoroughly enjoyed uh, very aggressive physical activity that way. Long story short, a family with a uh, kid like that have forgotten that there's a pecking order in society. Anybody who's been around chicken knows what a pecking order is. Chickens will pick on any weak one that's in the bunch. You know, they'll establish their hierarchy. They'll establish which chicken is in charge, and then there'll be a lieutenant, so to speak, and it goes just like a pyramid. There'll be one on top, and there will be some others along the way, and, and they're, most of them are just ordinary animals. If you let one of them start down being picked on, all the rest of them will jump on it. But those on the bottom won't fight the ones on top. Here's what happens. Animals of all kinds have that, but sometimes people are surprised that people act that way too. Take a bunch of kids, and one of them is picked on. Start being shoved around, what happens? Other kids start picking on him, too. And he can be tormented. <clears throat> he can be run out of a group or a class or school simply because he doesn't resist. Well, back to the question. This other family father came around to me and asked me one day, would you teach my son how to box? He'd seen me out teaching my son how to box. I said, I'd be glad to. Well, 
as soon as that kid learned how to box and box by the rules, he wasn't uh, he wasn't afraid. You know what happened? He started getting respect from the peers. He didn't have to fight. That wasn't necessary that he fight. All that was necessary was he show that he could, and he was ready. And the kids didn't pick on him. Besides, he was quite an athlete in his, in his own right. Very strong youngster. Very fast learner too. As far as I know, he never had a fight. At least what I knew of. And we're that way. You know, it's sort of like the uh, national situation, isn't it? If we have a strong army and navy, if we have a strong military, we won't get picked on. If you let the weak ones get started, they see that we're weaker, then we'll get picked on and we'll be bluffed and we'll be pushed around. So what people can do, who have pacifist ideas and they don't want violence, of course not. I don't know anybody who really is healthy who wants violence just to have violence. But uh, good preparation, a good defense is knowing how to defend yourself. Most of the time, that's all you need to take care of the problem. Well, until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one. Hello, I'm Dr. John Middleton. This is Family Life in the North Country. Start off with, a, I think, a rather interesting question today from a young lady. I say that, here's the question. She wrote that, I'm caught up in a serious personal problem at 16 and a girl and wanting to be what I think is a lady, how I should act and dress. How can I be a lady in today's society and still fit in? <clears throat> See the word lady there? Well, it is rare for anybody today to, to really think about being a lady. I think it's rare. I remember being made fun of one time in a ridicule quite uh, seriously when I uh, called two faculty members where I was teaching uh, ladies. Uh, they let me know in no uncertain terms that uh, I couldn't call them ladies, and uh, I was being something rather chauvinistic or some kind of patronizing. And to call them ladies was something it shouldn't be. Well, it wasn't politically correct, I guess, would be one way of saying it. And I just concluded and agreed with them. I said, that's right, you're not ladies. That's the way you're going to act. Back to the 16-year-old. First, congratulations. Congratulations on your ambition. And uh, you have the courage to have the right ideas to express them. Now, how can you be a lady? I'm going to quote a, a dear friend who's now deceased. She said, a lady can be a lady anywhere dressed in any fashion, and engaged in any kind of work. And she demonstrated that. Uh, being a lady is having a set of values, living by a set of principles. A lady can be a lady in blue jeans or an evening dress. It doesn't matter how the person is dressed. It's what the person feels, how the person then comes across and radiates to others. I've tried to study a lot about people's behavior, and that's what I find. I found that uh, being a lady is uh, interesting. First thing you know, there are going to be some gentlemen around. And whoever heard of people being a gentleman today, uh, It's possessing an inner strength, an inner strength and the courage 
to know who you are and be what you are. And you know what the answer to the question is, how could you fit in? You'll fit in very well as soon as others find out that you're real. You might even have some people who'd like to uh, take a lesson from you. But being a lady is not dependent upon how you dress. Now, that uh, obviously doesn't mean that people can dress flirtatiously, uh, violating the moral practices and principles, and <clears throat> acting certain ways, of course not. <clears throat> being a lady means that a person has moral values and lives by them. Now that doesn't mean that person is cold, of course not. And, a, and yes, a person can be a, a lady in a bathing suit. doesn't have to be uh, skirt length or ankle length uh, attire, not at all. Pick up the difference and I commend anybody who's 16 and uh, wants to pursue that because it'll be there. And uh, as soon as you start acting like a lady, there should be some gentlemen around. Boys start acting more gentlemanly. You don't see very many gentlemen these days. At least I don't. Maybe I'm not in the right crowd. But I see kids wearing their caps backwards, wearing their caps everywhere. And that's, that's an interesting thing to me. Uh, dressing sometimes in the most ragged clothes they can find, and if they're not ragged enough, they'll make them more ragged, get out a pair of scissors and cut them up, mm. doing things like that. I'm not sure what the message is sometimes, unless it's the message that uh, I can set my own standard. <coughs> I can be my own person. Well, isn't that nice? How can you be anybody else? Here's another question. At what age can parents safely begin sex education? Well, the answer to the question is parents uh, have already started when they ask the question. As soon as you pick up a child, a baby, an infant, you've started sex education. It goes on continuously throughout life and it's not a particular time you start it. Seriously. You go down to a, a newborn nursery in a hospital and you watch people come up and look at the baby and you listen to them. Sex education has already started right there. And of course the gender of the child has already been determined quite a long time, usually about nine months before. So uh, sex education is something parents cannot avoid. Now, a lot of them think they can avoid it. Put it off, let schools do it, somebody else do it. No. That attitude itself is part of the, what the child is learning. See, a parent cannot not teach a child. Sometimes parents think, well, I just won't have to contend with that. I won't deal with that. I'll let somebody else do it. Well, the child is learning from that attitude. So if the parents just accept it, that if I act in such a way that I like myself as a male or a female, as a man or a woman, this is going to be teaching the child how to act. And chances are that's going to be a good good sex education. Here's another question. It says, are people really ever adequately prepared for marriage? Been a lot of studies lately, right around us here, about marriage preparation. The answer is both a yes and a no. Yes, people are adequately prepared, can be. Meaning uh, they have an attitude that says they are, they are already enabled to face whatever eventualities occur, whatever problems jump up. The answer is no if it means they'll always know in advance what the problems will be. You know, in doing marriage preparation for many years, I've often said to people, I'll guarantee that you'll have problems. It's not whether or not you're going to have problems when you get married. What's more important is how are you going to face them? What are you going to do about them? And uh, we'll have perfect marriages just as soon as we have perfect people. 
so most people don't bother holding their breath. Here's another question. How old is old enough for the teenager to be left alone at home? How old is old enough? Think about your history. Think about yourselves. How old was old enough for you, the viewer, the listener? You know, it depends so very much on the individual. It depends on the circumstances, the length of time that the child or the teenager is going to be left. Uh, I think, for example, 16. <coughs> 16 is an age where I'd have to think about it, whether or not a 16-year-old ought to be left alone overnight. It's not whether or not a 16-year-old can take care of the situation himself or herself. And I'm well aware that a lot of girls are out babysitting at 12, uh, some of them even younger been taking care of brothers and sisters. There's a difference. When the children are really alone, there's a difference. Maturity, what is maturity? How does it get into it? I think we have to look very carefully, closely. So rather than just some magic age, you just want one to hang on to, I think 16, if you're going to be talking about overnights. 16. I'm well aware that people in service, military service at 17 can be trusted with all sorts of things, but uh, they've also been disciplined to act, to respond certain ways. So we don't need to add stress. I see people go off and leave children, and I think it's very stressful. <clears throat> Here's a question. It says, what's the biggest problem in trying to help someone? the biggest problem in trying to help someone. The biggest problem, I think, is how to help without hurting somebody. How can I help you without at the same time implying that you're inadequate, that you need help? So the interface between the helping hand and the receiving hand is very important. How is the relationship between the two people? If I can help without hurting, if I can help at the same time help you feel more adequate, then I've done a good job. But if my trying to help you causes you to feel less adequate, less fulfilled, then my helping perhaps is a, a more of a problem than anything else. Um, if you want to help somebody, sometimes ask them to help you. There's nothing quite so complimentary as to ask for a person's help. You know, most people will reply, they'll respond to a request to help. <clears throat> I've done that many times. If you want somebody to uh, like you, ask them to do something for you. I found that out, oh, I remember where I read it, about 1950. And I've used it many times. Now here's a question I guess it's going to take us up to about the end of the program today. The question says, would you explain three terms? Three terms uh, that you used recently in the presentation. And the three terms are pseudo-mutuality, family myths, and pseudo-maturity. Okay, start with family myths first. Some families operate as if certain things are true, that if certain attitudes, certain behaviors, and certain ideas represent the family. They operate as if they're true and when in fact they're not. Sometimes the uh, family may act, for example, like father always comes home from work tired. He may not be tired at all, but everybody's programmed to act as if he does. Or that mother has a headache. She may not have a headache. But mother always gets a headache when certain things happen. That may not be true. Families uh, sometimes are involved with believing themselves uh, better than they are. And believing them. There's not anything really wrong with that. But they may act as if they have standards and values which are quite different from the way they actually 
par. They just operate on a different level. Uh, called value stretch for a sociological term. And it's it's not a, an abnormal thing and not necessarily a bad thing. See, we believe that the group we belong to is better than the other group. That's typical. And we may operate on that basis, that this family is the best family, but in fact the family may be pretty low on the totem pole. But hey, it's good for everybody to think it's the best family. Family miss. Okay? Pseudo-mutuality. Pseudo-mutuality means false mutuality. Or look at it another way, false friendship. It's when people act as if they care about each other when they really don't. Best example of that perhaps is a sales clerk. Going to the store and there's all kinds of nice words exchanged, yak, 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 and people say, oh, I appreciate it so very much and I'll look around and I'll be back if I don't find something a little more suitable. I'll really come back and everyone yak, 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 and you know, it's acting as if they care about each other when in fact they don't. You know, some families are that way. What they're doing is acting as if there's warmth and caring in a family when there isn't. They set up a cool war situation, respectful, polite, but sometimes people don't really care about each other. Pseudo-mutuality. Then there's the other term, pseudo-maturity. We see a lot of that today. We see kids who are trying to act so mature and appear mature that we tend to uh, treat them as if they were. They're not. Drugs and alcohol, smoking. Sometimes kids do that sort of thing to try to take on airs as if they're really mature. The pseudo maturity, for example, early drug use, early alcohol use, doesn't make people mature. Usually it hides them. It keeps them from really maturing and growing up and developing mature ideas, while at the same time acting in such a way that they're appearing older than they really are. We see sometimes these children here acting and looking as if they're, they're old. You've seen old children, haven't you? I certainly have. Drinking, smoking, taking on behaviors as if, and dressing as if they are much more mature than they really are. And unfortunately, see, they start being treated as if they're mature. And that's where they get into a lot of trouble. It's not, not a good thing at all. Pseudo-maturity. We sometimes uh, look at it. I don't know any kid who hasn't wanted to appear older. See, that's healthy, that's normal. But to uh, do things that, that are abnormal and unhealthy and to try to do, to do something to appear old and just get that as a lifestyle. Now, street person, street behavior, sometimes is pseudo-maturity. Well, until another time, I'm Dr. John Middleton, Family Life in the North Country. Have a good one.